Hello all, I hope you're doing very well in these unprecedented times. Welcome to the Fintech Finance Virtual Arena where we are hosting you today. Uh, today we are joined by two legends in the industry. First of all, we are joined by Chris Skinner. He, uh, to, to quote him, he, he does all sorts in banking and technology. Is, is that pr pretty accurate, Chris? It's pretty accurate. And when you say unprecedented, I take it you mean Donald Trump. I, I, uh, yeah, I've, I, we've got a drinking game going with some of our team whenever uh, anyone says the word unprecedented, so I make sure I use the word unprecedented as much as possible. There I did wonder why it was in there, yes, there we go. There is a super cut as well, which I'm looking forward to them uh, putting together for after lockdown, unprecedented. There you go guys, there's another one. We are also joined by, Sophie, I'm always mispronounce your surname, we're joined by Sophie Gubard. Am I, am I pronouncing that right? No, <laughs> you are not. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> Gibo. We are joined by Sophie Gibo, who is the Chief Growth Officer at OpenPaid. How are you doing today, Sophie? You all good or good? Yes, very excited to uh, to be with you and uh, and see Chris again. Enchanté, Sophie. Nice to see you again. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, Chris, you're in Poland at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. Been in this room for a year. It's a nice prison. It's, it's not. It doesn't seem the worst, the worst prison. There are worse ones out there. There definitely are. We were lucky actually in that we moved to a house with a huge garden in November 2019, not knowing that we were going to be stuck in this place for a year. And uh, at least we've got a nice big garden and a monster of a beast dog that is actually the thing I call an elephant. <laughs> Excellent. Has the dog made any kind of appearances in any uh, virtual, uh, virtual things so far? He has, um, and definitely with his voice, he's got quite a loud bark. And uh, if you haven't spotted the elephant series on my blog, it started because basically this mad beast was in the room annoying me every day. But luckily he's now eight months old and has calmed down a bit. So uh, I can sort of move on. <laughs> Excellent. We are, we are going to come to the elephant. Uh, so I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up. But today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, embedded finance and separating fact from the fiction. So... First of all, to kind of kick things off, um, got to talk about the old neobanks. I, I lo love having all, all, all the cards. Um, to embedded finance, how far have we come from the kind of inception of the neobank as we know it today to the world of embedded finance? Um, Sophie, can I, can I get you to, to weigh in on this first? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's basically the evolution we have seen uh, happening over the past uh, 10 years, I think. Chris and I were there at uh, the beginning of the new wave of, uh, of fintech. <laughs> um, well, it's certainly the time I, I joined. Uh, I joined fintech, and uh, basically, the, um, this first wave was for me really impersonated by one side like um, the creation of plenty new vertical fintech uh, services, um, reinventing each part of, uh, of the bank, for example, and uh, by the neobanks, uh, essentially the arrival of uh, Monzo, Starling, uh, dedicated neobanks by, by niche uh, segments, uh, trying to answer like specific customer um, needs. And um, I think uh, basically embedded finance is, is the next evolution um, of it. Um, we have seen like a massive acceleration uh, at OpenPaid over the past uh, 18 months, I would say, of basically brands and uh, other companies that you could consider fintechs or not fintechs, but wanting to uh, essentially offer financial services as part of an evolution of their offering. Um, and um, and yes, yeah, so for me, it's the next situation, essentially. Excellent. Chris, can I get you to weigh in, weigh in on this as well, please? Sure. I mean, first of all, I don't like the word embedded um, and I disagree with it as a definition. I think we're talking about invisible finance in that it's no longer something consciously in the foreground. It's like electricity or water. It's just there in the background and you know, embedded finance, a bit like omnichannel, are words that are thrown around that I don't think represent the meaning of what we're trying to get at. So I talk about omni-access and invisible finance, um, which I think is far more appropriate. With the neobanks, you know, we've seen uh, the rise of many over the past decade, but the only one I think that's made any difference is New Bank out of Brazil. Um, maybe Tinkoff Bank in Russia. Um, but when we talk about Monzo, Revolut um, and Chime and others, 
have they seriously challenged the banking system or are they just wrapping around the banking system and coming up with some cool you know bells and whistles that people like like a coral card or something um but you know I actually haven't seen a fundamental shift of customers from traditional banks. I've seen 5 million customers or whatever with Monzo, 8 million with Revolut. Those good numbers, but what are they actually doing? Are they really moving their financial life to those banks or are they just supplementing their financial lives with those banks? And I think in the majority of cases, it's the latter rather than the former. I, I think it's actually sorry. Ali. I think it's actually a, um, a, a great point. Out of my personal experience, I think um, the one that had the biggest impact uh, was definitely Revolut back in 2015, as if like. I mean, we, we were all traveling quite, quite a lot as part of uh, our jobs and basically the ability of opening like currency accounts and not pay for these crazy FX fees was is definitely um, an evolution. But I, I, I totally see where you are coming from when, when you say, is it a supplement or a replacement? I think the, uh, the question is still uh, open, essentially. Just to put a kind of few restrictions on there, we're obviously going to focus very much on, on the retail banking because you could throw all sorts of wonderful arguments with uh, game stock happening in things in things like the wealth in wealth management. Just from a retail banking perspective, that's what we're going to be be, be focusing on. And Chris, I, I um, see my head agrees with you, but my heart does not because I I, I love using style. I love having you know the, the the bright colored cards, and I think this is fantastic. But then when I take a step back what what is different about it and for me and I, I i feel i feel horrible saying this i feel really horrible saying this i i kind of realized they were still quite the same when i was doing some stuff with my starling bank account and i realized that the statements don't match up perfectly with the actual interface on the app as well because it's still using the same the same system uh, oh, i feel horrible saying that now that that's uh, well, I, feel all... I mean just building on the point so my observation of the last decade of the rise of fintech and the billions of dollars invested is that the fintechs that are most successful are not trying to replace banking. They're trying to replace the things that banking does wrong or the things that banking doesn't do at all. So serving the underserved and the unbanked, which is what New Bank is doing and Alipay is doing and WeBank is doing, or dealing with the frictions of the digital world that the banks don't deal with well, such as the stuff that Stripe, Square, Adyen, Klarna and others are doing, are proving hugely successful. Um, providing cross-border and low interchange products, which is where Revolut started and TransferWise, which is now WISE um, focused, um, was good, but it's not sustainable. So I was talking about WISE this week with their rebranding. And for me, it's quite interesting that I use a traditional old bank product to do FX between the UK and Poland because they don't charge me a fee and the exchange rate is the strike rate at that moment. If I did the same transaction with transfer wise, I would have a fee and also an exchange rate that was typically 10% worse. So are they really doing a, a great service to the customer or does the customer even realize that there are traditional bank products or alternative products out there that do it better? They may not be aware. I mean, I wasn't aware until someone told me who worked for Ripple. And, uh, and, and, and that is the secret source that the, the product that I'm doing my FX with is using a traditional bank service that's an app over Ripple. Okay. I was about to ask you actually, what was the business model behind like the all free uh, service and if it was sustainable, but based I, I, on I, I, I should, I should tell, tell you the product just because it's, it's probably appropriate to mention. It's Santander and it's called OnePayFX. It was designed for internal people within Santander. And unless you're told about it, they don't advertise it, but no fee and the best FX rates in the world. So traditional banks can keep up with the models of those who are contenders. Actually, back in the day, like uh, HSBC had such services, except that like the, the fees were horrendous. But I had accounts um, in the US, uh, in France and uh, in the UK. And definitely you could do these instant transfers, except that basically they had made the decision to make a lot of money out of it with fees. <laughs> to bring it um, round onto, on, onto uh, 
embedded finance for you, Chris. Um, or again, invisible banking. Wh who's going to be impacted and what can they do to prepare? And also who has the opportunity to kind of get it, get it, get involved in this? I mean, are, are we going to see, I saw a thing about Ikea moving into banking as well a few, a few weeks ago. What, what are some of the niches that we can see starting to have this invisible banking, this, this embedded, embedded finance? Yeah, I'm worried about the IKEA bank because you'll need a screwdriver and a hammer and some nails and uh, to build it. But anyway, um, when we look at um, the, the build your own bank model, which I've talked about for a long time as banking as a service going back over 10 years, um, basically customers don't want to build their own bank. They want someone to build the bank for them that is the bank that suits them and their life needs and wants. And so the opportunity is there to build lifestyle banks, which is what IKEA and others are doing. Um, I mean, Apple, Amazon and Google are all in this space um, with Plex, Google Pay, etc. Um, but they're not building banks. What they're doing is they're building the ecosystem of bank APIs through the platforms to bring the customer the best experience ever. And the opportunity for traditional banks, if they want to take it, which many haven't made that decision strategically, they are tactically just you know, dancing around the idea, is that you could be the utility of choice for the technology digital ecosystem of players. As the utility, then basically you're not a dumb pipe, you're actually very smart. Uh, and you're sitting there saying, we're supplying the world of finance through APIs in the ecosystem to all the players who need it, particularly the big players, like the Amazons, Facebooks and um, Googles um, as their partner. And the ones that get in there as the first partner are going to get the first choice. You know, if you're second at the gate, you often don't get through the gate. Uh, Sophie? I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I, I agree with you that in, invisible banking is absolutely uh, like the, the, the like, I, I like embedded finance and invisible banking is very relevant for what we, uh, we are trying to, uh, to achieve. I think it's also a great point to say that basically like the, there will be a first mover advantage for the, the smart pipes in the sense that you see an acceleration of those uh, use cases like for example the announcement of, uh, of Stripe. I, I, I see it as taking the market by, by storm because for me it's like one of the most beautiful examples of, um, of what's coming up, right? Um, Stripe going into, um, into treasury powered by City, Goldman, etc. being the, uh, the, the smart pipe behind. You see like the infinite possibility um, that is coming uh, through it, like empowering millions of merchants to actually uh, manage uh, treasury, get bank accounts, uh, in time access loan loans. We have seen some uh, partnership coming up with uh, with Afterpay, for for example, and in the end also um, basically touch uh, the, the the life of millions of customers of of those merchants. So you can see actually like this net work uh, spreading um, uh, like uh, with a tide, let's say, um, uh, impacting millions of people with just a single um, a single partnership. Um, as of like uh, the the things we have seen at uh, OpenPaid, um, I mean we have, we have launched our uh, banking as a service platform. I would say around three years ago. Uh, last year, what we have decided to do is really to focus on specific segments uh, to to power um, embedded finance use cases. And um, the gambles that we have been doing uh, have been on uh, specifically crypto and um, and remittance use case. And I think the crypto example is a very interesting one. Uh, and maybe uh, Chris, you will be able to to be back on that. But uh, when we started those discussions around eighteen months ago, crypto wallets, uh, Binance, UOB, like all those guys, they were just like trading platform. You were coming with your Bitcoin, exchanging, and they didn't want to touch fiat. They were like, okay, let's just focus on, on the trading itself. And um, basically, we have seen a massive acceleration of those conversations where they essentially started with, okay, we would like to maybe start doing card processing and, uh, and not wait for our user to come with their Bitcoins because actually that's just for 
the geek or early adopters, but just really try to actually go into the markets uh, and um, and attract more people. Um, and um, and now, like the next evolution is that they also want basically their user to use banking and to be able to actually buy the coins on their platform by using their bank account and doing transfers. And the further evolution is now they want payment initiation through uh, through open banking. So um, I, I find it to be a very very powerful example of how embedded finance slash invisible banking can really supercharge um, a business model going from like something pretty narrow, pretty niche and uh, for only very um, specific um, uh, like target uh, use cases and, and people to actually try to, to go deeper in the market. Yeah, and I'll just um, pick up on a couple of points you made because um, specifically two points. One is that open banking is not about banks opening up to third parties, which is what in regulatory terms is defined as. It's much more around having an open API ecosystem of players who can play into this space and build new amazing custom experiences for living a digital lifestyle without having to think about finance because it's invisible and embedded and that's the critical point of the open system and i love square um and stripe in particular uh, stripe more than square to be honest in that um if you ever see me present stripe began as just seven lines of code uh with the collison brothers launching that in the beginning of the last decade um and now is a 36 billion dollar some people say 100 billion dollar business um depending on valuations that you see today um, but it's the beauty of the code that made it so successful. It's not the idea itself, although the idea itself is critical, but it's the beauty of the code, the simplicity of the code, the ability to use the code and how cool the code is. It's like art that other developers pick up and use. And that's what open finance in the ecosystem means to me is that you're launching beautiful code out there. And the banks struggle with that because they're not particularly good with code. <laughs> you know, that that they, they, they're still struggling with 1970s core systems that haven't been replaced. So they really aren't good with technology. And to launch code that's art is a huge challenge, which is why there are thousands of API players out there that are startups are doing a wonderful job to focus on pieces of that ecosystem. And I think the other part of that is that the ecosystem is now breaking down into much more micro focus. So rather than trying to be everything to everybody, the successful players are doing one little piece really well, which I've said many times that you know, 12,000 banks can do a thousand things averagely, whereas 12,000 startups can do one thing brilliantly. And it's the startups doing one thing brilliantly that's the huge success. And just finishing, coming back to, to uh, Stripe, um, I don't know if you saw, but they just appointed Mark Carney to their board, yeah. the former Bank of England governor. How clever are they? I've, I've seen a lot of things as well saying that um, it, you need to add an S to the end of gaffers, the S for Stripe for all the big uh, the big players out there, which I think with their valuation, Mark Carney is, is kind of appropriate. Yeah, yeah, but you've got to remember, I call them fat bags. And that's fat bags because it's Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Badoo, Alibaba, and Google and Stripe. Excellent. There's all the stripes in there. That's the that's that's the big one. Um, can I can I bring up uh, Uber? Um, and I don't mean in terms of the Uberfication as, as the buzzword, but Uber as Uber Money, uh, which I think was launched at Money 2020 2018. I want to say um, hugely successful because rather than being the intermediary, they're actually now kind of almost creating a bank account for the Uber driver so they can withdraw it as they go. Uh, it's quite a kind of early success story. Why is in invisible banking, why is it across the board still relatively unknown? I mean, can, can we see this kind of thing going into the likes of uh, Airbnb and, 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 and other, other brands out there? Why, is it, why hasn't it been adopted as quickly as perhaps it could have done? I mean, from, from my side, um... You know, I, I think a lot of it is because people struggle with what's happening and conceptually and strategically. Um, obviously, startups don't. And so maybe some of the startups are missing a trick with the other players out there um, that you've mentioned. But uh, I, I, again, one of the things that was notable the other day is that Pingit's now being shut down. 
from Barclays Bank. And I went back to a blog I wrote almost 10 years ago when Pingit started up saying how amazing it was and it could be um, a challenger that's out there with the squares and PayPal's of this world. 10 years later, it's disappeared. Um, and the reason is that if you're a traditional bank, it does tend to result in anything that's innovative being killed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I, uh, I totally support uh, what, what Chris is mentioning. I, I also think it's a, a momentum thing. So what you are mentioning basically uh, with Uber has been launched uh, with BBVA in Mexico uh, in 2019. And I mean, we are still at the proof of concept stage, right? Like the thing is that banking as a service has been ex existing for 10 years, like uh, Chris launched the world. So, but it has been existing for 10 years, but we have gone through several iteration um, of it. And um, I mean, I have been myself through several iterations of it for different market segments, according to what was the evolution of fintech uh, at the time. I believe that um, invisible banking embedded finance um, is getting traction as we speak. Uh, the concept uh, is not uh, two months old, but it's probably two to three years old. And basically it takes time to actually structure those offering. You can take um, offering from, from startups. There are startups that are there, but in the background, those companies, like those startups need the support of banks essentially to be able to provide the regulatory environment as well as the, uh, the uh, basically the correspondent banking, all that kind of, of thing. And for that to happen, those banks need to become comfortable with it. So BBVA has been comfortable with it since 2000, probably 18 or so with launching with Uber. Um, clearly, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, City Bank of America by powering Stripe are becoming comfortable uh, with it. So I believe it's gonna, like the waves you are uh, wondering about and when it's gonna uh, come up will take another few years essentially uh, to, to, to happen. But the momentum is here. There is willingness from those uh, people to go. I'm not saying 100% of the banks because that's not gonna happen, but we are, able to at least give a handful of those uh, of names uh, of um, companies that are willing to give it a try and that actually see a lot of potential in it. Absolutely. Um, I want to bring up, I, I feel really bad because I'm, I'm criticizing companies that I love. I, I wanted to bring up, uh, I, I didn't mean to criticize Starling earlier, but I love Curve. Um, and I've only ever had one issue with it where I had a fraudulent transaction on via the Curve card on to, onto something else. And I spoke to Curve, they said, speak to Tesco credit card, I spoke to Tesco credit card, they said, speak to Curve. I didn't know who to, who to go to. Eventually it, it was all sorted. What happens, for example, with uh, Uber and BBVA? Not not so much from a, from a legal perspective, but from the customers, where the customers sat. They want to simply know who is responsible. So when something go, goes wrong with an embedded fan, it, Embedded banking and invisible finance. When something goes wrong, who, who, whose responsibility is it? Just the brand that the customer sees. Um, so ultimately, it's uh, for uh, the license holder respons responsibility. So banking as a uh, service has a multitude of of setup. Essentially, um, us as a, as a provider, like either we only provide the technology and the accounts, and we provide that to. Um, to a company that has their own e-money license, or to some extent, we can make some startups uh, agents of um, our license. So the answer would be that ultimately, like the responsibility will end up with, um, with the license uh, holder. But in the end, the consumer don't care. They, they want their, their money back. <laughs> and that's what's the most important. I think what is um, very important in what we're building with embedded finance is in the end, providing the best experience possible, which means that um, essentially building processes um, of handling customer um, uh, requests, uh, complaint and support. In the case of Uber and BBVA, I haven't been experiencing myself uh, this, uh, this service because it's in Mexico and I'm not a Uber driver. But what I would expect is essentially uh, a chain of command or escalation where the consumer basically 
talk uh, to um, Uber as a, a first line of, uh, of service uh, to, to handle the complaints and for a second line uh, to be uh, essentially BBVA customer uh, support to actually handle, um, handle the, uh, the, uh, the, the complaints. But in the end, it's always going to be the brand putting their name and their customer experience first. So it's really about when you, you design an embedded finance um, uh, experience is uh, for, like making sure that the experience you design will be good for your customers and in the end when there is some kind of ex escalation that you, you you are sure that, that you can rely on your, your partner and that um, essentially uh, basically there is a chain of command to handle that. Yeah, I just build on your reply as well Sophie in that um, what Ali has pointed out is what potentially is used as the weak link in embedded finance in your account to third parties, then potentially you're risking your account to third parties. And if you lose money through the third parties, it's your fault, which then stops customers doing it. And it's interesting when open banking was launched in the UK that the media response was very anti the idea of sharing customer data with third parties. And you see that around the world. I've seen it in the US, I've seen it across Europe. Uh, GDPR he makes it, it, you know, is, is something that even makes it more questionable about what data can you share with whom. Um, but the bottom line of all this is that the regulator isn't going to bring in regulation that supports open finance if it's going to make the consumer less protected. The consumer is yeah. still just as protected as long as the regulations keep up. And this is where I think there's a huge friction because when you have 12,000 startups doing one thing brilliantly well that decomposes finance into all of its pieces and then someone can put them back together again to give the customer the experience they, they need, who is responsible? The answer is the company that's bringing them back together again. Because I define banking as a service can only be delivered by a regulated bank because only banks do banking. And a regulated bank gives you the 100,000 euro guarantee that you won't lose more than 100,000 euros if anything fails. And also they have the financial compensation schemes behind that that make sure you're insured around your transactions and the things that you're doing. So if you choose to have banking as a service delivered to you by a bank, then you, you are protected. It's then the bank's duty and responsibility to do the, the diligence of third parties that they're bringing into your network to get you access to your data and if they didn't do the due diligence well enough it's their fault so that's where i think the liability lies in it and the friction really is between the regulatory landscape keeping up with the micro players and the banks themselves being more open to partnering and cooperation rather than trying to wrap everything around and scare the customer absolutely why with being on the subject of the regulatory bodies um Chris, this is your chance to uh, uh, to chat about China, which I know you're a big fan of. Which region uh, do you think is taking the lead with embedded finance? Because obviously there's the regulation that goes along with it. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been a fan of China, although I sort of was a little bit disappointed with the Ant Group IPO that was halted by President Xi um, due to mainly, it wasn't down to Jack Ma's comments, it's more down to the fact that um, they have a huge issue in China with peer-to-peer -peer lending and the whole um, way in which the capitalization of loans is um, implemented. So mm -hmm. under the new rules, um, Ant Group have to um, provide at least 30% of the capital behind any loans they're making. Under the old rules, 2%. So that's a huge difference. And it's to do with the stability of the Chinese financial system. Um, you know, at one point there were five or six peer-to-peer -peer lenders failing every day in China during summer 2018. Um, so that's an issue there. Having said that, the Chinese model is interesting because it has the super app model where your social and um, commercial and financial life are all integrated into one uh, system which cooperates around each other. Uh, which you don't have in Europe or America, you know, under the regulatory rules, social, commercial, financial are separated. All those interesting PayPal are now saying they want to be the super app that brings all that together. I'm not sure they can because of the regulatory structure. Um, and the one thing that has always stood out for me about Ant Group and Alibaba 
uh, and I use it in all my presentations, is that when you look at the new business model for digital finance, then it's based around front office apps linking to middle office APIs and back office analytics. And Ant really gets that model. So they have the super app front office that's all the different things you want to do socially, commercially and financially wrapped into a API link to all of their back office platforms, one of which is Ant Group with Alipay. But the other uh, is cloud and another is um, what they call their data analytics group that has all the data mining and artificial intelligence. And that's called Ali Mama because Mama looks after Alibaba. So good, I like that. Um, Sophie, from, from your perspective, are there any particular regions, I mean, we talked a bit about Mexico, that where you, where you see embedded finance really taking the lead? I, I think it's like not a, like so much of a region plays and a brand play essentially. So we have been mentioning Uber, we have been mentioning Stripe. I could mention Grab that has done uh, the, the same for, for their drivers. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I don't think uh, uh, there is a regional thinking as much as actually um, a momentum thinking in terms of brands and actually maybe the start with the most obvious uh, experiences and use cases uh, towards maybe less uh, and less uh, obvious one or more complicated to, uh, to, to put to life. Um, so, yeah. So well, the last thing I want to uh, bring up is um, mainstream consciousness. Do we think that embedded finance is going to be kind of the, uh, the go to for years to come? Is it going to gain mainstream consciousness? I don't, yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> say mainstream consciousness at, at all. I think it's something that we would just do without realizing. So I, I think it's like maybe a bit of like open banking. People don't, don't really have like so much opinion about it uh, in the public. They just see that they, there are PFM platforms coming up and that is pretty cool to see all their finances at the same place. They, they find that it's convenient to do a payment initiation at, at the time where they are like making uh, their, their payment on an e-commerce platform or, or something like that because because maybe it's more convenient to them than using a card. And I believe embedded finance slash invest invisible banking um, will be about that essentially, but it's gonna be everywhere. And that I am 100% sure about it. And maybe we can watch this, uh, this record in 10 years time and, uh, and, and see, but um, uh, I, I think it's not so far away that basically you will go with your, uh, and maybe it's already the case actually, because I don't have a Tesla, but you go in your Tesla to, to basically uh, charge it and you go out and you have paid for whatever service that you, you have used, like the electricity, that kind of thing. And I think it's that type of experience where we are going towards. Right now, we are like very much geeking around with fintech and platform and stuff but i think actually like it's gonna go much beyond that you can think about your your fridge ordering the food itself when they know like you don't have your milk anymore or that kind of thing on a weekly basis and all your payments being linked to that and do that for you without you thinking about it so for me it's gonna go as far uh, as that I don't know how long it's going to take, but I, I think all of that is definitely possible as, as we speak. So. so I like that a lot. It's almost like a step towards that, um, the world of, of uh, or the economics of, of Star Trek. Big, big fan of the Trekonomics book. So it's kind of a st stepping in that kind of direction where you don't even need finance at all. There's no money in Star Trek. Yeah. Um, as you'll know, at 11FS, we say digital is 1% done. So there's 99% to go. And, you know, we're very early on the um, trajectory of what's happening right now with the digitalization of life. And right now, when you think about, you know, your phone runs out of battery or your computer breaks down and has to reboot, or um, if you just lose a link during a conversation on a video call, um, not everything is always working all the time as it should. Maybe 10, 20, 30 years, it'll be very different. And in banking, um, you know, we don't need mainstream consciousness because if it's invisible, it doesn't matter. It's just a utility in the background that um, runs in the background whilst we live our digital and physical lives and get our needs and wants fulfilled. 
Um, but the criticality here, and this is something I picked up on the other day when I was seeing Monzo has all these pots, and it reminded me of intelligent finance had jars, and that's intelligent finance of internet online banking service of 20 years ago. And the financial people like to think of jars and pots because they think that's what customers think in their own lives. They have jars and pots of money. You know, there's a pot of money saving for my holiday. There's a pot of money saving for my kid's education. There's a jar of money saving for my marriage or there's a jar of money for, for so I'm saving for, to buy my next car. Uh, and I just think that's so old fashioned thinking. It, you know, even Monzo, in my view, has old fashioned thinking in that context. Because what I really want is I open an account with a financial provider who's providing banking as a service so that they're a licensed bank. They integrate everything around the world of the ecosystem of APIs and analytics and apps to give me the best customer experience. And as I interact with that bank as a service, they learn more and more about my life needs and wants. Nothing to do with finance, because I don't wake up thinking I want to pay for something today. I think I wake up thinking I need to eat today. I need to go to the um, town and therefore I need some petrol today. You know, those are the things that you're doing. It's not payments and transactions and finance, it's living a life. So really the, the bank as a service should be providing me the intelligence to organize my jars and pots based on how I talk to it. I should have a voice interface or a video interface so I can talk to and say what my needs and wants are and how I want things to work. And they should only actually talk to me because they're invisible when I'm breaking limits of the things I said I need and want. So I can't afford to go to town today because I can't afford gas today. Uh, yes, you can eat today, but make sure it's a McDonald's rather than a, a Michelin star restaurant. You know, that's what my bank should be doing for me, not me having to work it out for myself. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to speak with us today. Um, Chris, are you, are you on Twitter or anything? I'm everywhere. <laughs> but yeah, Chris underscore tw um, Skinner on Twitter, uh, thefinancer.com and uh, captaincake.com. Excellent, excellent. So if you where, where best to find out more about yourself and, uh, and open paid? Um, so LinkedIn, uh, mostly uh, on Sophie uh, Gibo. Uh, so uh, G-U-I-B-A-U-D. Um, yeah, and on openpaid.com for, for, mm. for the website. Chris, did you just broke your news right now with us? Uh, I'm not making it official yet. It, it, it's, it's a teaser. It's a, it's a, so, a soft opening for Captain K. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Which I discovered is actually something to do with um, cannabis. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs>